The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Um, welcome to the Stoa, everyone. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. The Stoa is a place for us to cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And I see we have uh, some new faces here. Uh, so you might be asking, like, what is the Stoa? Um, one thing about the Stoa is that we don't talk about Stoicism. <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a practicing Stoic, but, you know, hardly we talk about Stoicism here, if, if not, I don't think we ever do, actually. We talk more about Buddhism and stuff like Awakening, oddly enough. Um, we had Shenzhen Young. We have the, the fine folks from Revolving Ground and the Monastic Academy here often. And we have uh, basically all our guests today have been here before. Daniel Ingram, this is his third time. Uh, Michael Taff has been here, and uh, everyone's favorite infinite bra, Frank Yang, and of course our very own Evan uh, McMullen is a regular here at the STOA. So if everyone except the guests can just turn off their video, because we're going to, um, this is going to be recorded and put on YouTube, and that helps with the, the recording. Uh, so Frank, uh, Daniel, Michael, and Evan, keep your video on. So how today's going to work is uh, it's 90 minutes in total. Uh, the first 60 minutes is going to be a dialogue between Daniel, Frank, Michael, and Evan. Uh, and then the, uh, the 30 minutes after that is going to be a, a Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions, start throwing your you know, question in the chat. I'll call on you and mute yourself. Uh, this will be on YouTube. So just indicate that in the chat. Um, so I'll take in Evan in a moment. And then Evan's going to launch the conversation, sharing his thoughts on the kind of the theme of awakening. And uh, when Evan finishes speaking, whoever is called to go next, whether Daniel, Frank, Michael, feel free to jump in. And when you finish speaking, the next person feels free to jump in. And it's just an organic, free associative conversation. Uh, no hard rule, uh, perhaps, um, you know, share the conversational airspace. Uh, it's really an emerging conversation, so it can go anywhere. Uh, uh, and it's dialogos is the term John Rebecca uses to, to describe um, dialectic kind of being in a flow state. And so that's what sort of the, the what we're trying to engender here. So that being said, um, I will take in Evan in a moment and th there might be some video lag between Daniel and Frank's video. Um, so just be mindful of that um, when we're speaking, just to give a little bit space uh, in between uh, shares. That being said, Evan, you're up my friend. All right. So again, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, let's just go right into some Dialogo surrounding awakening. So where I'd like to sort of start this conversation off is by noticing that in so many ways, we have sort of upgraded our framings and understandings that we've inherited from the past. So for example, in physics, we might still talk about energy and matter and so on. And yet the uh, the meanings of those terms and the degree to which we're able to precisely define them has changed and improved quite a lot since say Aristotle was talking about physics 2000 years ago or so. Um, so it seems that our understanding of awakening and related concepts might be lagging a little bit um, compared to our understandings of say, the physical world or even other aspects of human psychology. So I guess, um, with that in mind, where I'd kind of like to start the conversation off is, is the question, so when we speak of awakening, are we speaking of a single thing that is more or less the same for each human being that would have more or less similar neural correlates for each human being? Or are we actually speaking of a plurality of divergent things? And since we might want to bear in mind that we're using language to point at things, right, indexically, then um, is it even useful to talk about awakening as a unified thing? Or should we completely just say, okay, this is old language, toss it out and come up with better languaging. So I'm curious if anyone wants to take a stab at that, we can go from there. Well, you started out with a really easy question there, Evan. That's, you know, we can, we can nail this down in a couple of minutes for sure. Um, nobody agrees very well on what awakening means. Probably you can't find two people on the earth who would agree, even if they say the same sentence about what they think it is, what they mean by that sentence will be different. And I think, um, 
one of the, it's always been that way. And if we go back, you know, historically and look at uh, different traditions and the things they were writing within that traditions, within those traditions and the discussions they were having in those traditions, it's always been like that. You know, they were trying really hard to say what they meant about awakening. And even with these really fine, finely, finely grained discussions, disagreeing, right, about some of the fundamentals. I think something that we're looking at now is the possibility of bringing in, you know, brain scanning and neuroscience and stuff to, um, to clarify the situation. And uh, I'm a big fan of that stuff. I think it's cool, but I also think it's limited. It's not, I don't think it will be the case that we'll have, you know, here's the neurological definition of the one true awakening and that's it. Um, if we do have that, it will be a massive lo information loss. I mean, I think it will actually be a kind of reduction, the bad kind of reduction, where we've oversimplified and lost a lot of really important stuff. So I think we have a great opportunity, and also we have to navigate that opportunity in a really subtle and um, nuanced manner. The thing that we're doing right now, though, like having these big online discussions about this topic, this is like the, the golden age you know, it, certainly in our society, but in world society, there's times in, let's say, Buddhist history, like Nalanda University or something, where things like this occurred for several hundred years, and those were the, the wonderful times, right? So I think we're doing the right kind of thing and by talking like this, and I'll shut up. <laughs> Daniel, you seemed like you had some thoughts there. I should mention I'm not sitting near my keyboard, so it, like I can keep going up to unmute myself. But anyway, sorry for that break and flow. Um, uh, uh, so I think that there are some reasonable universals to some of this, right? There are some reasonable, um, there are plenty of seeming variants as well. Sure, there are all kinds of you know discussions about no self versus true self and luminosity and emptiness and God consciousness and you know, oneness and non-duality and, uh, you know, so you get into a lot of that. But phenomenologically, I actually think when you start actually trying to dissect what people are actually experiencing, there is more commonality than I think, um, you know, I, I don't think it's so, you know, straightforward that really everybody just disagrees and nobody has the same definition. Um, I think actually there are certain traditions where the definitions are, are so straightforward and you can see literally hundreds of people, you know, suddenly attaining to something that phenomenologically seems essentially identical from a lot of capability point of view or very, very close enough to reasonably put in some big baskets. And I think that some of the pointers as person after person has noted, such as it's going to be fascinating to see what, you know, Frank says talking about this, you know, we've been left these trails of breadcrumbs by people. And when we follow them, we run into something like the stuff they, they described in ways that are surprisingly reproducible sometimes. And so, yeah, a lot of variability, but it's not so straightforward as like everybody disagrees. And it's just kind of this big mishmash. You know, I think it's the answer is going to be a nuanced summer in between. Hello? There you go. Okay, so yeah, I, I think I agree with uh, both of them. I think it's both something that's, it's, I think it's one realization, but different flavors. So it's both. Yeah, so there, there are, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people who have had like awakening experiences and most of them, despite the different languages that they used, uh, you can get a sense of it uh, from quote unquote beyond the mind that they're coming from the same quote unquote energy. Even though, again, that manifestation of the energy can be different when it's like transmitted to language or through visual images or through however way they want to describe it. Um, that's always going to be a little different. But even within the language itself, I see a lot of similarities in the way people describe it. Um, and I also think that, you know, sameness of difference, codependent rise, they're really two sides of the same coin. So for me, it's always the same and different. And I like what Michael said about how we're doing something that's totally like kind of new, but all at the same time. Um, I think Osho said that um, if you put like all those 
<laughs> you played like the music Bach in the beginning, uh, Peter, right? So yeah, someone like Bach or like Beethoven or, um, you know, a lot of Western philosophers like Sartre and Heidegger and uh, uh, Nietzsche, uh, Regina Wolf, uh, you know, James Joyce, all those guys were, you know, they were dabbling around with the idea of awakening, even if they don't know it. So there's something universal about even leading back to Plato. Even a lot of the pre-Socratic uh, pre guys were pretty, pretty awakened. Um, I don't know, you know, you can't really tell, but based on what they're writing. Um, but then they were all like dancing at the edge of their minds in a sense. And then they didn't have the proper tool like we do now with the internet. You know, you can order uh, online courses online and you can order psychedelics online. You can, you know, book retreats and the discussions like this online and every tradition is at the fingertips of everyone. So we're in a really weird space where like waking is so much easier, but at the same time, it's so much harder because it's always a double-edged sword, you know? So there's a lot of distraction, but at the same time, there's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, wisdom, some nuggets of wisdom just at your finger, fingertips for everybody. So I don't know if that answers your questions. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess I'll take a crack at, at sort of uh, synthesizing and, and uh, answering my own question here as well. So one of the things that I, I think I've noticed is that when you look at the traditional maps, they do seem to have some level of convergence, at least up to the point that in say, um, the models that, that you and Daniel use frequently would be called stream entry, right? That seems to be almost a necessary upgrade for further progress. Now, what's really an interesting open question to me is the degree to which after that there's one path with one destination, or distinct paths with distinct destinations, right? So um, I, I kind of view stream entry as a, as a transformation to the way that you experience the construction of phenomenal reality. Cool, and it's a pretty consistent transformation across individuals. I can get on board with that too. But then when you look at all of the different traditions, all of the different techniques, all of the different um, reported experiences and seemingly manifested abilities that come after that, I start to get pretty suspicious of the idea that there is in fact a fairly linear path after that. And so I want to get your feedback on that. Define stream entry, Evan. <laughs> define stream entry. Okay. So um, define stream entry. That's an interesting question. I think you're trying to do uh, to, to show me exactly how hard it is to define that, right? Um, I, I guess I would say um, having some level of actual um, fairly persistent realization of the degree to which one's phenomenal reality and specifically one's emotional um, relationship to phenomenal reality is um, contingent rather than necessary, okay? So, and what I mean by this is there's a sort of fundamental insight that seems to come along fairly early in the process whereby people notice that their brain is doing something in between reality and and what they experience as self right okay so that that's that's a sort of series of gestures in the direction are we roughly on the same page or does that just sound completely crazy you know fascinating uh description right i like it i've never heard anyone else say that sequence of words right so it is unique uh, uh, Shinzen Yang would, uh, uh, at least, you know, when I was studying with him full time, would say uh, stream entry means you realize there is no thing inside you called a self. Period. That's the end of the definition. Um, I'd like to hear what Daniel says. I'm sure Daniel feels he can describe it pretty clearly or define it pretty clearly. So give it a shot, there, Daniel. I'm uh, seriously, it'd be fun. So I, I think um, so. There are lots of places where someone might realize the sense that this was all transient, I mean, even in early stages, the very first insight of mind and body where suddenly you can see, see thoughts as experiences. Someone might get the sense, oh, wait a second, maybe I'm not my thoughts, oh, wait, I can observe my bodily sensations too. Maybe I'm not any of this. And this is actually a super low level insight that just happens to translate really well to higher insights. But someone might even at the very first, very first insight stage say something like that. And in the same kind of way, when one sees, say, cause and effect, you might say a sensation and some a mental impression arise or an intention and something arise. And so you might just, as, as you described, have 
um, the sense that there is go something going on between experience and self, or the sense of self, which is a doer, a watcher, a knower, a controller, beer. And yet you, these are some of the lowest insights. So a really skilled analyst of what the implications of experience might be, might say that very early on. And certainly a lot of people after say the arising and passing away or peak experience or Kundalini awakening or some big explosion or blowout on psychedelics or breakthrough or whatever you, you know, pick your favorite, you know, terms for that kind of territory, right? A lot of them may have had some profound unitive experience or, you know, divine experience or cosmic consciousness experience where they might have those insights. And then later on, as they find their body dissolving into fragments or, you know, you know, sputtering off in strange, you know, terrifying directions or whatever, you know, if they go through some sort of dark nighty process, they might then go, wait a second, I'm not in control of any of this number. None of this seems to be me, you know, like there's something going on here, but, you know, and so, and then out equanimity, people similarly might say, things like wow it's just all flowing space it's all just connected cosmic consciousness it's all just like luminous emptiness it's all just you know arising and vanishing on its own or something and so even at places where on a Theravada map they would be below stream entry some people depending on their sort of analytical philosophical you know tr bent training whatever might say things like that and so actually i use much harder criteria that have to do with like you know ability to rapidly access certain states as soon as you drop in and you know ability to rapidly cycle through things ability to um you know have the supply to essentially a whole layer of mind off the cushion effortlessly you know um the ability the, you know the ability in some reasonable portion of people if they're technically trained and will under you know willing to undergo that sort of a process to be able to have replications of reality synchronizing and vanishing or some people just have this open sp happen spontaneously and so i use a whole lot of technical criteria but again there are plenty of traditions that don't use anything like that so if one were to say equate the first boomy and stream entry as plenty of people do like would any tibetan teacher just say anything like what i just said i don't know like but you know and so we start running into some of the problems with the the sense of the universality of some of this and then if you talk to the zen people god knows what they might call kensho or satori or or who knows what the fuck, right? I mean, sorry. Um, and so, you know, like there, again, there are problems between the traditions linguistically and terminologically. Sorry for a long answer, but at least it was thorough. Okay, <clears throat> so I guess it's my turn. So I tend to just define awakening in a very simple term. It's when you dissolve the center, when you dissolve every single, what I call every single speck of solidity in your field of experience, including your body mind. And there's gonna be a point where um, <clears throat> the last speck of the self is gonna be somewhere in the center, in the head. For me, it wasn't the head, maybe for some people it was in the chest, but you're just gonna start unraveling, unraveling, unraveling your sense of self, like peeling away layers of layers of an onion until there's nothing left. But then after that last speck is gone, there's a very definite moment, at least in, my experience, I don't know about anyone else's experience, but in my experience, there was a very definite moment where it felt like I used to be this island on um, this vast spacious um, ocean. And then all of a sudden, uh, throughout the spatial path, I was dissolving this, uh, this layers of this island, uh, this island until every single last speck of it was gone. And then there was this huge ocean of, call it whatever you want, consciousness, awareness, or emptiness that just washed over itself as itself. It's kind of like this morbid strip where it just got kind of like this, infinity thing that connects to itself and then when that happens um that's what i call awakening and to me that's the most obvious thing that i've ever, obvious in existence that i've ever experienced is existing being conscious of itself and um <clears throat> but it's always been like that right it's just like the solidity of the person has been obscuring that you know that what i call like perfect knowledge quote unquote zero syncing syn syn up to zero um what a lot of traditions called know thyself and you know the lord um yeah, so for me, it was just closing that loop of infinity, that circuit of the strange loop that is you and everything else. Um, to me, that instead of just defining stream entry, um, I would say, to put it in a more simple term, awakening is dissolving every single speck of solidity within your field of experience until um, whatever is left in consciousness or awareness just connects to itself as itself universe fucking itself <laughs> at that point it's just like that's the most obvious thing in the world right um <clears throat> and the the path leading to that what, what daniel described um uh stream entry uh i would say that if you really if i would to define stream mainstream in a really definite way i'll say if you have 
uh, a, a succession experience or a non-experience that belongs to no one, 100% of the time you would have a stream entry. But I don't think you need a succession to enter stream entry because we have successions all the time. We have smaller like micro successions, just witnessing like a phenomenon vanishing. That's a micro succession. When you go to sleep, that's a succession, right? Um, so I'm not sure if like succession is like the number one factor or the most definitely factor to determine stream entry. But I'll say that if you had a legit succession, then in my book or what I observed in myself and other people's paths is that 100% you have stream entry, but I could be wrong. And a few more of these, maybe you die over and over again hundreds of times and you have like a few macro successions, the macro nibbanas, and each succession seems like it's a quantum shift. So each succession seems like you just jumped in a new reality where the sense of self just gets even smaller. And the reason why I emphasize the succession moment so much is because really that really feels like a, like a, like a flip where the other events or non-events on the practice didn't feel like a quantum shift to me. So I guess I kind of conjure up the both answers and just like, okay, the point of awakening is to dissolve every single speck of solidity, but succession seems to be, to be the most effective way to determine that is happening. Even though in, the, in between successions, there are little moments of dissolution, um, like Daniel said, rising and passing, dark night, blah, 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 but that accumulates in a succession. So I don't know. <laughs> so one sort of interesting tension I'm picking up here between these descriptions <laughs> that I want to kind of zoom in on, um, and I think this is a, 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 it's a common thing that a lot of people end up confused about, right? is the degree to which we might describe awakening as a particular set of experiences, which could be bounded within time. And that's the sense that I at least got listening to your description, Frank. Whereas say, um, with, with Daniel's description, I got more of a sense of a sort of set of functional capacities, which could be called on at any time in the future. And so I wanna explore that tension a little bit. So I'm curious if anyone here has a, uh, has some thoughts on that. I'm sure you do. Um, well, the I mean, the practices and the experience that leads up to the recognition of emptiness is happening in time. That belongs to the relative level of the person of the seeker. But then when like the big bang happens, um, that event, that, well, that's why I call it a non-event that belongs to no one, because that event in itself is beyond space and time. Um, but then I'm speaking from the person's perspective. So it is in a sense still inside space and time, right? Um, but yeah, but I, there, I mean, after that thing is accessed, um, there is gonna be moments where it's more or less uh, more clear or less clear, but it's there, it's there locked in. Like it hasn't changed. Like Daniel also said, when the center is dissolved, it's, it's stay dissolved. I, I can't tell you why that is. If it's a purely neurological event, which I don't know if it is, then it makes no sense that whenever that center dissolves, it stays there no matter what life circumstances you're going to. Like I can do the most fucked up shit and the center will still be not there. But before that center was dissolved, I could go hang out with friends and have some kind of moments where it's sort of, I feel more solidified and that center will you know, reconstruct itself before it was completely dissolved. So there really was for me at least like a, like a threshold that was crossed. After that threshold, quote unquote, I went quote unquote, outside space and time, nothing that happens within the space time continuum could affect that lack of centeredness. Mm. That's just my experience. So um, I'm interested to hear what anybody else says about that. Well, I'm gonna echo a little bit of what Frank is saying and some of what Daniel's saying and, um, and talk about, you know, uh, the fact that after awakening, even a momentary awakening, um, it's not about what you're, what's happening in the content of your experience necessarily, right? It's more about where you're coming from. And I think this is one of the biggest things that people um, misapprehend at first is that they think the, the awakening is going to be something that happens in their experience out here and uh, a particular uh, set of, of um, things is going to happen. Whereas what actually is important is what happens to the viewer of the experience, mm -hmm. right? And we can say that various sorts of things have to change there and they change either temporarily 
but still importantly, because then after that you have access to that state or over time, hopefully much more stably. Yeah. You're able to access that way of being either continuously or in a stable way for long periods of time. And I think that, well, so in other words, to put it in kind of overly simplified terms, it's not the content, it's the context, right? The, the, the where you seem to be coming from changes from an encapsulated uh, sense of self to awareness itself to deeper and deeper and deeper levels of awareness itself. And even though I started off talking about like how varied this all is from person to person in terms of how we talk about it, I do think that the that the the capacity of human beings to experience awakening and levels of awakening and deeper and deeper awakenings is universal. You know, it's part of our it's part of our brain. It's part of our mind. It's part of our uh, um, human. Uh, capacity, right? And so there will be something that we converge on, or maybe several things we converge on, that we would say, okay, this is doing certain types of awakening. Hopefully over time, we can tease these apart into really well understood phenomena. And, and yet, even with all that, I will say that culturally, and individually, it will still vary you know, in terms of how it shows up for each person. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, and, and sort of what a, a much better phrasing of what I was trying to get at when you put me on the spot and asked me, so what is stream entry, right? <laughs> so, you know, there's this notion in um, computer science, right, of higher order functions, functions which take functions as inputs, right, rather than functions that take numbers as inputs. And I see there being an interesting similarity here where, we're, we're saying that we're actually doing a sort of higher order functional transformation to the functions which are perceptual and to the functions which are responsible for constructing our experience of self or not constructing it as the case may be, right? And I think that that is, you know, for maybe some of the engineers in the audience, one interesting way to think about the sort of um, common misconception that people often early on have that you were referring to um, there. So so just thought I'd put that out there. But Daniel, it looked like you had something you wanted to jump in and say. No, no, I'm actually uh, fine. Please continue. Um, <laughs> oh, sure. I'll say something real quick. I'll say something really quick. Uh, okay, so I think the, uh, the, I think the realization of emptiness in and of itself is universal for everyone. But the path leading up to it, there's infinite numbers of configurations. And what you do with the emptiness, like the form you fill out the emptiness with could be different from everybody. And I think Kenneth Folk had a really funny description. Um, he said that after what, what he calls fourth path, um, the developments continue and you still go deeper and deeper into the emptiness, like Michael says, but uh, the, the way that each being develops after emptiness it's so different. It's almost like comparing like Michael Jordan to like Serena Williams or something like that. And I, I find that very interesting. I think it's like emptiness. And so that goes back to both, you know, it's both the same and not the same, you know, parts are contained in the whole and vice versa. The, there is the universality of emptiness that I described with the, you know, the, 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 the reality recognizes itself as itself. I think that's the universal more or less for everybody. But then what you do with it after that, could be very different. And that's why I started to look into like other traditions like Vajrayana and Mahayana after I've completed the path of, at least Daniel's path of Theravada, because that's how I know. <laughs> I, I'm not that familiar with like the old text. The, uh, the only thing that I know from Theravada path is really from Daniel. And uh, <laughs> what everything Daniel says in that book, um, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 like he said, it, it, you can reproduce it, at least from my experience. And I've talked to a few other people who have followed the same path. And back to what we were saying before, they reproduced it pretty much down to the uh, micro details. So that's very fucking weird. Uh, the same thing is not that weird because why, why would it be weird, right? Like <laughs> we, if we all had the same body, like, like say, if you put like 10, like 10 bodybuilders who maxed out their physique on stage, and if you just like on trained person looking at their bodies, like Ronnie Coleman versus like Kai Green, whatever, they all look pretty much the same. We have the same similar structures. Why wouldn't we, right? If you look at, if you put 10 like virtuoso violinists on stage, they all play the same piece of music. The top level virtuosos sound more alike than people that aren't as good. Isn't that weird? <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if that just popped in my head. 
And I think one of the big issues that we run into a lot is what I call the descriptive fallacy, that people experiencing something that phenomenologically is similar will describe it in similar ways, because obviously there's a tremendous amount of linguistic conditioning and um, conditioning based on technique and teachings and exposure that all will uh, profoundly influence what aspects of the thing someone might emphasize or how they might describe it. Or uh, And there's also the other way that um, people can have lots of different experiences and also um, you know, use the same term for them. So like jhana, for example, is one of these classic things, these deep meditation stages are sometimes not so deep that people might describe with the word jhana and yet the criteria for what those can be between you know, speakers might be unbelievably different. And so I do think that when trying to sort this out, uh, asking people carefully what the terms they mean are, uh, you know, what, uh, and what they actually are experiencing when they say them and to use very simple language for them, I think that's really important when attempting to have these sorts of conversations. So I want to kind of uh, throw a little bit of a wrench into the works here and get to something kind of spicy, because that's part of what we do in these Stealing the Culture with Dialogo sessions. So um, one thing that is sort of uh, not so much of a secret anymore is the degree to which many of the most prominent um, teachers and practitioners of Buddhist inflected and other um, traditions of awakening got their start or their inspiration or continued to use a part uh, as a part of their practice uh, psychedelics. And so um, this is of particular interest to me because I actually discovered meditation and psychedelics within like two weeks of each other. And I have never been able to disentangle which things had which causal effects in terms of the transformations that subsequently happened on my consciousness, many of which seem to have been pretty freaking abiding at this point 18 years later. So um, I'm quite interested to know, um, you know, as, as long as we're doing the interesting spicy Dialogos thing here, what are your thoughts surrounding um, things like that, both uh, psychedelics as having some relationship to states that we might refer to as awakening or stages that we might refer to as awakening? Um, are they related? Are they completely unrelated? I, I know everyone here probably has some thoughts about that. I've never done any psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> your shirt says otherwise. I think I heard a talk. I heard a. I heard a, after one of your guided meditation, you say you've done LSD like hundreds of times. But <laughs> did I say that? I can't remember. My crazy <laughs> I know you can't. I, of all the asses, yeah. <laughs> you say a lot of things. <laughs> For you or not? <laughs> At least half of the people who ever taught me did psychedelics first before they got into meditation. Maybe more than half. Um, and it was a critical part of a number of them's discovery that there was something other than sort of ordinary muggle consciousness, right? Uh, you know, vanilla consciousness. And um, so, and about at least, you know, the people I've talked to, probably a third to maybe a half of them, I would guess that psychedelics have been and or are some part of their path. So clearly it's a, it's a huge part of what's going on. Um, that said, you know, a number of the monastic people who taught me, I would be quite surprised if they had ever done any drugs, particularly the ones who have been, you know, monastic since they were kids, for example. Um, and, you know, so, and these experiences started happening to me, you know, when I was a kid, long before I had done psychedelics. And so, uh, you know, obviously, um, there, there is this really complicated relationship between these two that has been described lots of places and by lots of people, but there's no doubt that they can give some people a taste of things and or catapult some, uh, you know, break down some barriers, catapult people into territory they might have had a harder time getting into, who knows, et cetera, right? Well, I, I think what Daniel says about human experience, the author says with consciousness as a kid, I think that's the same as psychedelics. Uh, as in that psychedelics is just one of the tools that shake you out of your normal states of consciousness and make you realize that there are other stratum of the mind that isn't available to you right now, even though there are other, many tools and methods for that. Psychedelics, I, I think, is one of the most direct and effective tools and the fastest tools for most people to glimpse what's beyond their, I guess, normal states of consciousness. And that could be anything. And But the, the, the reason why psychedelics can't be in and of self 
uh, a tool to uh, awakening uh, completely is because it's not really about states of consciousness and it's about accessing as much as many different states of consciousness as you can and then just identify from the world realize that emptiness is really apart from that but also gives rise to it so i think psychedelics is a great tool for oh i'm gonna smoke as much psychedelics as i want i'm gonna have five million dmt experiences where i experience god consciousness but then i'm still not satisfied just like jhanas why did, why isn't the buddha satisfied after jhana jhanas are just states of consciousness because it's not about states of consciousness at the end it's about that which gives rise and is the part in a sense but not totally apart because nothing is apart ever apart but it's it's a way for you to experience certain experiences so you can say okay maybe it's not just in the experience so i always said that understanding this path has three levels one is intellectual the first is intellectual you have to understand it with the mind um and then the second one is an experience you have to sort of have an experience uh out of state experience or at least an experience of what you read on the first level and third one is realization or wisdom uh or awakening so i think Psychedelics can get you to number two, they give you experience right away, but then you can't lock it with just psychedelics because uh, wisdom or realization is locking a certain state or non-state into a permanent shift. And psychedelics obviously doesn't do that, at least from my personal experience and from experiences of people that I've talked to, psychedelics doesn't last. And I think one of the reasons is because psychedelics just, you don't have enough time with psychedelics to, like I said in the beginning, dissolve every speck of solidity within your field of experience. It's just not enough, enough time for that. Because for that, you need like industrial strength, meditation or contemplation or whatever technique that you're gonna uh, apply it, to like- It kind depends of like, on- there, but, 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 but like digging a hole in like Andy Dufresne, digging a hole in Shaw's strength redemption coming out through the other side. You can have a psychedelic experience and have a, have a sort of like a VR experience of what's on the other side, but you have to actually go in there and do the dig like quote unquote physically. That's why I call it a contemplative fitness. <laughs> yeah. De depends on the dose you take, Frank, about whether you can dissolve everything or not. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think that the, even with a really high dose on something like 5 email DMT, you can dissolve it right there and then. It feels like that. But, but, but when you go back to your everyday life, when the drug wears off, the solidity reconstructs again. Sure. I know a, a, a handful of people who <laughs> I'm relatively convinced actually got something permanent and beneficial. Okay from psychedelics. Now, I also know some people who seem to have really seriously damaged themselves from psychedelics as well, which is a relatively small number also, but still they exist. And so I think it's actually the tails on this thing. There's some long tails, right? And, and tail one and bad effects and tail one of good effects both exist. And so um, I, I seem to recall, actually, Michael is going to have something to say about this for himself, right? Yeah, I certainly uh, experienced some what I would consider, and other teachers have told me, uh, awakening from just a ton of acid, you know. And uh, uh, what's a ton? That seemed, um, I don't know. I mean, I've certainly done like maybe I don't know something be like seven hundred acid trips, and some of those were very high dose. I just don't. It was street drugs. I don't know the dosage. <laughs> And, and I, I actually, sorry. <laughs> Dude, <that's crazy. laughs> I, I want to actually support that point too here because when I mentioned that I've been unable to disentangle the effects, that's really just me being charitable to meditation, right? So, like, I did an experiment where I did um, doses of at least 15 milligrams of 5 meo DMT at least once a day, every day for three months, right? And that seems to cause a pretty permanent shift in consciousness that still hasn't gone away, right? Now, other people who I know that did that have seemed to be, as you mentioned, Daniel, fairly profoundly damaged, right, um, after similar types of experiences. But what was interesting about that is that after that, I had many similar, you know, like several hundred LSD experiences, and that just seemed pretty old hat at that point. It was pretty easy to navigate, felt pretty normal, you know, like cool, whatever. So something had shifted there. And uh, the reason I think it's important to talk about this stuff is because when you talk to people, especially younger people who are interested in meditation in our society, they're often also interested in psychedelics still. That's often still how people get into it. And I experienced from the, the Buddhist community writ large, say, you know, 18-ish years ago, what felt like to me something on the order of gaslighting surrounding the connection, right? And so I think it's actually quite valuable to um, make explicit the fact that there is some sort of connection going on between the sort of transformations and the sort of um, changes in consciousness, which may in fact be persistent, that one can have 
um, from a from a psychedelic set of experiences versus say from a meditative set of experiences, because I personally at least don't see any a priori reason why the technique of sitting by yourself cross-legged with your eyes closed in a dimly lit room and following certain instructions should be able to produce abiding change, but you know, having several hundred acid trips shouldn't, right? So, I mean, that, 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 that demands an explanation more than just no meditation is pure, we said so, this is what the Buddha said, right? So um, I think that you know, it's, it's, it's quite important to be clear about what we know and what we don't know. And at least from my perspective, it seems that what we don't know here is pretty profound. And a lot of the claims of, oh, well, no, it's psychedelics are qualitatively inferior to meditation for the purposes of transformation and awakening, um, that this is a quite questionable claim with insufficient evidence. So yeah, that, that's kind of why I brought that up. I want to agree with Daniel here and say that, uh, you know, out of all the people that I've talked to, which are a lot about their psychedelic experiences, I feel like very few got any real awakening out of it. And also very few got seriously damaged by it, but you can be seriously damaged by it. Like that's important to always say in these conversations. hundred um, percent. Just like you can by intensive meditation or sometimes right. even not that intensive meditation, right? Very I've talked true. to people all day long who have been seriously screwed up um, by intensive meditation practices and sometimes again, moderate to lower dose meditation practices. Though again, the tail starts dropping off, the probabilities go down, right? So there is clearly some distribution of dose dependence. That's right. And, you know, it makes a, 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 the kind of word on the street with the sort of old school American Buddhist teachers who all did psychedelics that, you know, you get the glimpse, but then you have to work your way back up there. It's pretty, that's pretty good advice. You know, it's like you, you can get a glimpse, but you got to learn how to abide there. And uh, I feel like some people do get some abiding stuff out of it, but even from there, now go further, right? Be able to uh, uh, take yourself uh, there continuously uh, forever. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a play of both. I think, uh, like when Evan said, like he's done psychedelics and meditation at the same time. That's why I gave him the ship, not just psychedelics or just meditation. And uh, I, I think uh, like a glimpse, even though I say psychedelics can give you a glimpse, that glimpse is just as important as everything else because without that glimpse, you wouldn't be able to try to lock it. So, so I do agree that psychedelics plays a huge role even in my personal journey and a lot of people's journey that I, that I know of. But what I was saying in the beginning was purely through psychedelics, I'm not sure if I've at least myself seeing anybody that locks anything. I don't know. I think I've heard Daniel say it somewhere that he has never seen a, even a stream entry on, on psychedelics. But then I heard mm, another. That's not, no, that's not true. No, no, no. I know. I know a few people who I think. Um, uh, it's just a very small number. And uh, yeah. And so. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's why I was interested because I think I think later on when I listened to a new interview, you did, I listened to a new interview you did after I read that somewhere in your book. Or so, <laughs> you, you you changed your view about that. So I was I was interested because maybe you you discovered a few cases where that happened, and I was kind of really excited about that actually. Yeah, there's a, there's a few I think um, cool. who did something but, serious. Yeah, but but, but they did they, they, they did also have a, a systematics and meditation practice along with it, right? Uh, not all of them, no, actually. Oh, no. Okay, so, so potentially you could be one of those people that only take second second Alex and just take acid and then at least get stream entry, potentially, or that has been recorded. Um, something very much like that seems to have happened to a few people I know, yeah. Um, at, um, yeah. But, but then you also have people who never practice meditation and have awoken. <laughs> That's true, I know, yeah, people who just woke up, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And people who've never been on retreats, never right. done serious practice, right. they're just awake. They're just, yeah. they're just <laughs> yeah, they're they're lucky really ones, good. cool. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot along the lines of that that last um, exchange here, I I, I want to sort of um, you know realize that we're we're speaking in this conversation with a, a good number of participants here um, who are shortly going to be asking some questions of us as a as a as a group as a panel, and um, I guess um, people are presumably here because they are interested in the topic of awakening, not just as a sort of intellectual um, diversion, uh, but as as a practical reality that might be realized. And so I am quite curious as far as um, 
when we are interacting with people, do you think it's possible to give generally valid advice? Um, or do you think that advice has to be fairly specifically tailored to the individual? Um, uh, because I think this is a really important question, you know, is can we can we just give really great, wonderful general advice or do we really need to establish a sort of deep teacher student relationship with someone that has some of the deeper experience. Um, so, so I, I'm, I'm curious, again, to see the thoughts of the panel on that. You know, uh, general advice is general and so it's it's kind of can help you come along, right? And some people can follow it for whatever reason. There's just a certain percentage of people who it works for. But so I wouldn't say anything's absolute, but I would definitely land in the camp that would say, you know, historically, this is sort of one-to-one -one, teacher to student. Uh, and that seems to be the best way to do it. Just like some people can learn to play the piano, from just a book, but most people sit with their piano teacher and learn to do it. It's just an easier way. I just wanna add, I'm really glad you used that, that musical analogy there. I think that's such a powerful analogy. And, and it's, it's really, this is a crucial question for people in this day and age, right? Because you have the old school guru models that, that demand you know, full devotion to a guru. And then you have the sort of modern mindfulness models, which say all you have to do is use an app on your phone for 20 minutes a day and you're good. And, and a lot of people out there, I mean, they, they basically ask, well, which one of those is it? And of course, as you pointed out, there's tales to the distribution. There's a, whole, there's a whole set of concerns where there's some generally applicable advice. But I think it's good to be explicit about the fact that, yeah, for most people, if you want to get the best results, you don't try to teach yourself piano from a book. You learn from someone who can play piano. That's, that's I think, a very good read on the situation. But it sounds like, Daniel, you seem like you have something you want to jump in and say here, too. So I'll stop talking. Actually, I just basically largely agree with what the two of you both said. I was largely nodding in agreement. It's kind of like emergency medicine. Like when you're working in a level one trauma center, probably actually 80% of the patients, if the nurse saw them and ordered what they thought the doctor would order, they would order, do nearly every single thing they would do and get it right and it would be straightforward. And then you've got like another 15% or so that it's really good. You had a mid-level C or something, you know, an advanced practice provider, or someone who's got some more training. Because and then and then there's that one in 20 patients that you really needed the attending with a ridiculous amount of training and expertise and knowledge. The problem is you don't know which one in 20 <laughs> ahead of time necessarily, because there could be mimics and surprises. And so um, in the same kind of way, I think it is for meditation advice for like 80% of people, a lot of the time, you know, so some basic advice and techniques and stuff is going to be fine and they'd be okay, right? And then you get like the 15% that are getting into more interesting, complicated stuff, right? And, and it's really good if they have some, you know, people have some, you know, feedback or some spiritual friends or whatever. And then like you get the one in 20 or something that like, no, they seriously need someone who's got at that moment, like who's got real skill and real nuance and real capabilities and deeper levels of insight and realization and all that stuff, because otherwise, you know, they're just going to run into trouble or they're not going to get something they needed that was critical for whatever was going on with them. So I think there's some kind of a curve like that. Um, and I guess the critical question here is one is noticing for yourself which one of those groups you fall into at any given time, right? Sure. Um, you know, this has always been an interesting question as, uh, you know, if you think of people as, as consumers of meditation training or consumers of various other techniques for self-transformation, um, in general, it seems fine. You're, does your teacher have to be some fully enlightened, totally accomplished person? Generally not. But then when you get into trouble, who are you going to call, right? Um, and so I wonder, you know, we have so many different divergent bodies offering this sort of teaching. You know, every, there many high profile teachers have their own teacher training programs. They have their own lineages, you might say. There's the traditional lineages, of course, and Zen and Tibetan lineages, Theravada, other traditions. And so um, I guess one of the things, and I know this is a big question, but I, I just short, you know, sort of like, simple advice that people and in, in the, uh, the participants here might be able to take with them. Okay, so I'm really interested in getting serious about this stuff. What advice might you have in terms of the selection process for how do I go about learning this and, and what's the best thing to do? Um, <laughs> 
I know it's an impossible question, but it's one that people ask all the time. And so if we've got a reason why this is a bad question to ask, then we can give that reason too, right? But, but the point is that, uh, you know, sort of modeling the questions that I've been asked by God knows how many people over, over many years, it's like, well, um, it's a really tricky question, but, but people, uh, people do seem to want to ask it. And so if the, the best answer to give is, well, that's just a malformed question and you just got to figure it out yourself, cool. But, uh, but I'm curious to hear people's takes anyway. I have something that I want to say about. Oh yeah, so when Daniel used the analogy of the the medical doctors and used analogy or Michael used analogy of being a piano player, um, I, I want to say that I think meditation or at least maybe meditation, not meditation, but awakening itself is I think a little different in a slightly different category than that because apparently awakening is finding your true nature or whatever everybody's. Uh, abiding universally and for for being a piano player and for being a doctor I don't think anyone can become a doctor by himself in a cave uh, I don't think anyone can pick up how to play the Sabellis concerto in violin just by giving him a violin since he was an infant someone has to teach him that but for awakening like we said earlier some people are just awake naturally but I don't know if anyone that became like a PhD doctor or like a surgeon without any teachers. So I think maybe meditation is in a slightly different category or maybe not even meditation because meditation is a skill like those, you know, like being a doctor and playing the ballet. I'm more talking more about awakening itself. So I was just wondering, I don't know. I just threw out, threw that out That's there. A fair so. point. Interesting point. Yeah, thanks Frank. It's cool. It, you know, it is the, the, the natural state of, natural of state. being, right? Yeah, this natural mind. There's some part of us that is just like that. Um, go ahead, Daniel. Oh, sorry. Uh, back to general advice. My first advice I give to nearly everybody is lead through strength. Do what you're good at and follow what you're drawn to, right? Um, unless it's something really crazy or exploitive or whatever, like avoid the super, you know, but um, other than that, like if, if something excites you and you're like, wow, that really looks cool. And I think I would be good at that. Like that's the direction to go at least for a while. Yes. Later on, you may have to fill in strengths and shore up, you know, things and broaden out and, you know, whatever. But one of the first things just for beginners, like uh, just, just go for what looks cool play with what seems fun and what what calls to you and draws you because it's more likely that you will be successful like whatever sense modality visual auditory somatic you're like you know more naturally inclined to pick a technique that you know plays to that strength if you like movementy techniques versus still techniques like just pick the one of that you like if something has trappings and aesthetics that you really like and are like god those zen guys have such style or man i love those tibetan hats or you know the christian contemplative with their hair shirts or whatever it is you know is really working for you like go for that so that's the first thing because like you're you're the most likely to get some early successes, to, to see something that works, to find that spark of joy and connect with something that's exciting. And then you'll have more likely to have a foothold, like uh, some sort of grasp on some, some uh, you know, inborn now experiential appreciation of the cool stuff and the potential of this. Something that I, uh, I agree completely with what Daniel's saying, for sure, go for what's just inherently fascinating. And also, um, you know, uh, under the principle of by, you know, their fruit shall ye know them, like, check out the teachers. What are they like? Do you like them? Do you want to be sort of in that same mood, you know? Um, because presumably they've done a shit ton of that kind of meditation and it started to affect what they're like, right? And uh, of course, uh, understanding that you need to check their background and whether people, you know, there's any record of malfeasance and all that, not just how they look, but you're going to notice that the mood that these practices uh, from different traditions evoke is really kind of different. You know, even if the awakening, uh, whether we <laughs> agree it might be the same, how it's man, how's it, the form it takes looks pretty different. And so uh, I found in in working uh, for so many decades with different teachers that just um, uh, even in non-meditation topics, like in college, I just found the professors that I thought were amazing and I just took all their courses regardless of what they were teaching because there's something about just like, oh, 
be like that, that is the, there's a sort of a transmission that takes place. And I don't necessarily mean that mystically, but just you're learning something more than just techniques. Yeah, I, I love that. That that was my approach to college uh, as well. And I think it really applies to to so much. You, you, you want to learn from people you want to be like, basically, right? Um, and, and so that's really great advice. Now, uh, we could just keep talking all day, but there are so many really good questions from the audience. So I'd like to tag Peter back in since he's been monitoring the audience chat to go ahead and bring some more voices into this conversation. Beautiful. Uh... That was dope. <laughs> uh, enjoyed listening to that conversation. And thank you, Evan, for uh, being the point person there. So um, we're not going to get to all the questions and we're not going to go in order, but start throwing your question in the chat if you have any more. Uh, we're going to go with Max. Uh, first of all, let there be light in the STOA. Everyone can turn on their camera right now so we can see everyone's face. Um, uh, if Max, you can uh, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Peter. And Daniel, Frank, Michael, I'm a big fan of, of all of yours. So my question is about uh, why enlightenment? You know, they say before enlightenment, the laundry, after enlightenment, the laundry also. And a lot of people seem to struggle to articulate what the big deal is. And I know that Daniel, you've written before that enlightenment really doesn't solve a lot of your mental stuff. People still get neurotic and angry and upset and with all the downsides that are that are possible, you know, this possible permanent muscle stiff, stiffness, you know, periods of deep depression, um, antisocial tendencies, it, it <laughs> can seem like a delicious psychosis in some ways. So I would love to hear your each of your individual attempts to um, pitch enlightenment, for lack of a better term. Go for it, Daniel. God, <laughs> well, I, I often don't. I mean, you know, I, I, I think um, there are people who are already in it, right? There are, people, there, there are people who are already, they find themselves on the path somehow. They find themselves called to this stuff. They find somehow it's happening. The process begins. There, that some voice says, do this, or you know, they chance into it through some party you know, adventure or whatever it is, or childbirth experience or however, and they end up on the path. So for those people for whom the process has really started in a, in a very obvious way, I would say um, definitely learn to work with what's going on on the path. For people for whom that has not started, I have actually a very different reaction. Um, and I think that to, to talk with them, you should have a reasonable uh, discussion of risks, benefits, and alternatives. Like, is this something you want at this place in your life right now? Do you really want to get into this? Are you willing to risk the strange and destabilizing and job and vocation and relationship? You know, all the, the, the stuff that can go really um you know sideways sometimes um and you know and then are, is it calling to you to be able to say see thoughts as thoughts naturally to have a very you know high degree of natural sensate clarity to know something profound about non-duality to change or you know something in your relationship to some kind of suffering or pain or emotional stuff like you know do, do they have a road to power as we call them like what is it what's the draw and if so do, is that strong enough to make you want to you know give up the vacation time and pay all the opportunity costs and all the stuff that may be for some or a lot of people involved in the path and so and and so i actually think that some reasonable sort of conversation about what's drawing the person and is is what's kind of the ethical thing to do because it is as you point out a strange thing to do and i think getting as much reasonable information about the range of what can happen and then hopefully the probabilities of that which is why we've got the eprc project which i'm working on so hopefully we actually have better data to inform reasonable decision making you know and what techniques are more or less likely to lead to certain effects both positive or negative that i actually think you know having an ethical conversation about this is still in some ways sort of in its infancy from a western medical ethics point of view yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, uh, I, I was writing a book for a while that had the title, um, a book on meditation, particularly for uh, awakening called This Book Will Wreck Your Life. 
<laughs> and, you know, part of it is that's, you know, a fun marketing title and stuff, but part of it is just truth in advertising. And, and uh, honestly, I never go around, like, I'll definitely say, look, some basic kind of meditation at a really light level is probably good for you, for probably everybody, you know, but if you can possibly avoid doing this, you probably could. <laughs> you know? Like going for the deeper levels, it's just, for whatever reason, there's a certain percentage of humanity that is irresistibly attracted to go into this deep area. And, uh, and it's, so it's not a sales pitch and it's not like, Hey, here's what you'll get. If you, you know, order before midnight tonight, it's like this for most people, this, you, it's hard, you know, this could be defined as a life shattering experience that you never want to repeat, you know? Uh, and yet for, as Frank keeps pointing out, you know, like, Hey, there's something very natural and human about this also. And it's kind of, you know, if we think about it in a multiple lifetimes, you know, viewpoint, which I only do sometimes, but maybe it's something that's just supposed to happen, you know, like people get there one way or another over time, who knows. But I would say that it is particularly fraught if you start looking at it like costs and benefits and stuff. It just does not, for some, for some reason, it's resistant to that kind of analysis. It's sort of, I don't know, this is not, you know, not the right metaphor, but, um, you know, like, uh, is poetry worth getting into? I mean, I don't know, do you like it? Are you, you know, can you avoid getting into it? You probably should, but if you can't, go all the way, you know. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I guess I wanted to push a little bit more also on the idea that it's supposed to alleviate a large class of suffering because, I mean, pitch is the wrong word for, because it's not just in terms of costs and benefits, but it does seem quite curious that if for something that's supposed to alleviate a whole class of suffering, that there are all these things, and I just sense some kind of tension with like sometimes things that Frank has said and some things that, that Daniel has, has written. So if, yeah. If Clearly some profound portion of the suffering that I had because of dualistic illusion is gone and thank fucking God, right? Like that was the most important, profound, useful, uh, excellent, uh, absolutely worth it thing I ever did in my life. Thank, 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 thanks, thanks, thanks for everything that contributed to that. That said, the cost for that was non-trivial. Right. And I was lucky I didn't have kids. I was lucky I didn't have aging parents. I was lucky that, you know, I could wreck my finances, life, career, medical school interviews, you know, and sometimes health, uh, you know, and yet still had some backup that helped me get out of that. Like, you know, there. Uh, yes. And so both are still true. And does that help? I don't know. Um, As an engineer, I like to use a sort of um, engineering analogy here. I'm, I'm a programmer and that's sort of, you know, what I do half the time. And uh, so I think of it as sort of like you're running Windows, right? And Windows <laughs> has a set of problems, but it's pretty well understood. The problems you're likely to, to get are ones that you can easily Google or call a professional to help you with. And like, it's, it's one state of affairs, right? If the problems you have running Windows are so intolerable to you that you want to take the plunge and go and install Linux, oh boy, are you going to have a whole other class of problems. It's not a panacea. You're going to have to get much more familiar with the way that your computer actually works at a deep level. You're going to spend a lot of time in the debugger and on the command line, which you pretty much never have to do in Windows these days. And so part of the question here is which set of problems do I want to have? Do I wanna have the problems that come from an obsession with increased clarity? Or do I wanna have the problems that come from a sort of blurry vision? Because they're, they're quite distinct and I don't really think that there's a right answer here for most people um, so much as there is choosing between different sets of problems. I wanna watch my kernel recompiling. <laughs> Definitely get enlightened then. So, um... For me personally, suffering was never really my goal. Like I suffered a lot pre-awakening, but it wasn't my goal to end suffering when I stepped on the path. It was just to have the most mind-blowing experience I can have. Even before the path, when I was experiencing with, uh, experimenting with psychedelics or weightlifting or reading a lot of books, 
um, I just wanted to experience things and understand what experience is. I wanted to fuck the universe and then allow the universe to fuck me. And right now I'm fucking the universe while the universe is fucking me. That's what's perfect. But anyway, sorry. So suffering was never really my goal to eliminate. But then <clears throat> if I, you know, looping back to Evan's point, uh, before I got on the path, I had a lot of suffering, but it was all like sort of like manic depression or like ADHD and all that stuff. It was like a very personal level kind of depression and anxiety and suffering. And once I got on the path, there was a lot of suffering too, but it was more like existential, it was more like dark night stuff. So I was switching from one set of suffering for another set of suffering. And the difference is this new set of suffering, I felt like I got something out of it. I feel like I was being changed, being rewired, like physically, mentally, metaphysically, whatever you want to call it. And then that suffering is, is a tool, as means to end to eliminate all other sufferings previously and on the path as well. So even though I wasn't my goal to limit suffering, I, I can confirm that my suffering has been reduced by 99% over, almost overnight since I dissolved the center. So, and hasn't returned yet so far. Uh, so I'll say, yeah. And also I'll, I think that like Chirodasa said that practice uh, uh, awakening is accident, is an accident, is a divine accident, he said, and practice is make it accident prone. And even if your goal isn't enlightenment awakening, which I don't, personally, I don't recommend people to have that goal right in the front of them once they start to meditate or start the path. For me, that wasn't even my goal either. Like aside from just understanding experience, I wanted to understand how the mind works, how consciousness works. What the fuck is this? Who am I, right? So even if you don't, Put awakening or enlightenment as your goal even if you don't reach there even if you don't get struck by that divine lightning whatever you did before uh whatever meditation contemplating practices or yoga practice you did to get there will benefit you as a character as a self anyway so it's i, I think it's a uh, it's 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 it, there's going to be positive and of course negative no matter doesn't matter what you do anyway so and yeah so I don't know where I was going with this. So yeah, if you want to get on the path, I, I would just put the awakening enlightenment thing like in the way back of your mind and just do the practice and see how that affects your daily life, how that makes you a better violinist, how that makes you a better uh, bodybuilder or more aware when you eat and have better relationships, or whatever. And awakening will come when it comes. If it doesn't, fuck it. <laughs> awesome. So uh, we're going to do the next question. Um, Peter Jones, uh, I, I, I could, couldn't tell if you wanted to ask a question or not. Uh, could I take you in? Oh, well, I do need to check out, but I could ask it. I could ask uh, quickly. I, I wanted to ask the August panel your thoughts on on uh, what I call falling off the horse. So it's not losing the path, not losing the Dharma, but just really falling away from from your sense of awakening, this kind of idea of systems theory, call it eroding goals. There's a place that you've had a peak, you kind of return and you come back and 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 you might not be at the same level or the same sense of, of clarity that you were before. We go through patches, we go through periods, we fall off the horse, we get back on again. Um, in, in Christian contemplation, there's this whole kind of field of, of of um, a space for just you know really being okay with with how life occurs too. There's not a, a sense of a of a pinnacle, I guess, of a way that oh, that uh, oh, oh, you know there aren't so many definitions as there are in Buddhist Dharma. But like there is this definitely like falling off the horse and getting back on again. And, and how do you how do you find that in um, occurring in in your experiences? What would you say? Well, I'll speak up and say uh, I, I, I'm always using this uh, ancient uh, uh, phrase, uh, the lumps in the gravy, right? So sometimes certain parts uh, in certain conditions and certain parts of life, the awakening, the awakened uh, mind is very available. And then you'll find in other situations, you know, for whatever reason, it's triggering in some way, it's too chaotic in some other way, the external situation, maybe certain aspects of that are not so available. And over time, as uh, your awakening deepens and broadens, you're going to start running into the lumps and the gravy, like situations where it's just difficult to maintain 
that awakened state as deep as you're used to, uh, or as uh, solidly or stably or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's always there, right? But your access to it might really be uh, um, sort of like clouded by the situation. But this is actually a good thing. You know, it's showing you where, where uh, you're not really able to contact emptiness in a situation, right? And it's asking you to learn to just to use, again, to like blend up that kind of lump into emptiness. And now suddenly awakening is available in that situation next time, right? Because you've learned. And over time, when you see this with very long-term practitioners, you know, I see, I'm extremely happy because I see my uh, wife, Christina there has joined. So I get a big smile when I see her. But I mean, she could confirm that there are lumps in my gravy. You know, it's like there's stuff that I get upset or I'm a total dick or whatever. I mean, I'm sure she you know, could confirm this. And it's like, um, uh, this is where the work is. This is where over the decades you learned, you know, that's, uh, that's the edge of your practice and it's always growing. This is why I really resist any model that there's some final awakening or final enlightenment because there's always more work to do with those bumps. You know, and so what I would say is if you're falling out, in a way, that's kind of cool. Now you've found your edge. Let's play with that edge. I would say that, um, you know, every reasonable model of the path that I'm aware of, it's a nonlinear thing, right? So people have peaks and then crashes. People have periods of serious excitement and periods where they're just like, no, no way. People, you know, phases of insight and then integration. Um, Bill Hamilton, who's one of my teachers, used to say, clean up, trash out. So he'd go spend like a bunch of months in some monastery and then go debauch out in Bangkok. You know, and that was part of his, like, it, you know, whether or not that was rationalization or intentional path or some tantric genius or just some dude having a party after his retreat, I don't know. But, um, you know, that that sort of notion, <laughs> um, you know, is, is, is uh, you know, is, is a recurring theme. Um, and something, you know, the sort of, you know, people oscillate, they're this way, they're that way, they're really engaged with this, they're really into that. And, you know, like whether the phases of practice and life move through our path, and that's just the nature of causality, right? It's got texture to it. It's got, um, yeah, this, this fluxing, changing thing, big cycles, little cycles, cycles that last months and years, interests and flowing back and forth. And then you know re-engagement and then disenchantment and and all of that. That's just the nature of this beast, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I think the little vessels, like the little bumps or the negative emotions of the cravings, are actually great vessels for realization because there's a lot of energy in there for like alchemy. Because if you just sit through pain, that pain or craving, that's why retreats work. Once you sit through a certain amount of pain and you cross that threshold, that pain barrier, it becomes bliss balls. And that bliss balls is already embedded within those uh, craving balls or pain balls, or else you wouldn't crave in the first place. So they're all core dependent right through each other, right? And every time you have a negative emotion or craving, you sit with it for after a while, you realize that that is made of the same clear light of awareness as the clear light of the awareness itself. And sometimes like negative emotions and solidities and bumps in the road makes it that much mm -hmm. easier to see the clear light of awareness because that's why so many people that awaken were so fucked up before awakening. Like they were, they were super messed up because they, they, have, they, they have to awake and they have so much tools for them to construct into emptiness. They have so much form as raw material for them to dissolve into emptiness. So it's almost like if you have a lot of like waves and oceans, in a way it makes it that much easier to see the ocean and see that you were never apart from it. So that's why a lot of people like the edge of their like insanity that's when that's when they wake up <laughs> you know, like I totally is like a really good example it's a huge bump in his in his body mind so much that he wants to like shoot himself and then he uses that as a vessel as a as a tool to you know perpetuate himself to like to the next level I don't know <laughs> I love it thank you thank you his responses are, uh, uh, yeah I'm gonna leave this evening with a uh, with a real happy sense of of yeah, happiness and uh, uh, response from that. Yeah, Evan, uh, do you have? 
Anything well, I guess, mean? yeah, I mean, echoing what my fellow panelists have said, I think that to a certain extent, the falling off the horse metaphor even guides you a little bit astray, right? Because you're supposed to be on the horse. And if you fall off, then something's gotten fucked up, right? And at least, even if you fall off the horse a lot, if you keep on doing this thing, then the more you recognize the falling off the horse process as part of what's unfolding and just that's what you flow with. You, I, I like the metaphor of dance a lot, right? Like reality is my dance partner and I need to respond to the way that it's going. And so if it does something unexpected, then I try not to, you know, fight that. I try to flow with that because it's going to look, it's going to be a lot smoother and better dance if you just go with the flow. Um, and, and so to me, the falling off the horse is a part of the arising of things that happens and resisting that just doesn't really make any sense. Also, the, the further down you go on the path, um, the less those bumps are going to be, they're, they're going to be less, for me anyway, I don't know. But like there's certain like there, if you had an insight or an actual like you know nugget of um if you had, if you went through a shift it, it's it's locked in right and when it's locked in I don't know about other people but for me when you have an insight it's always locked in go well, out it wouldn't be an insight because insight is what appears to the person what the nature of experience reality is always been like that right so every time you have something locked in the the bumps or the um like the moments when you fall off the wagon. <laughs> will become easier in the sense that you know when something's locked in you're never going to fall deeper than what you already thought before like if it's locked in here if you if you're falling over here the next time you got over the hump and you locked it in over here you're going to be falling over here and not here so there's a progression of it if you are actually making progress that's a reassurance it's saying that okay I'm, i've made all these gains this permanent all, all this permanent shifts i was locked in and i have this huge bump here but it's not going to be like here it's not going to be like weightlifting where when you get fat, you can get, you can be like 300 pound fat after getting into like really good shape. But for me on the, on the spiritual journey, you can never go back down to like a 300, 300 pound fat lar once you've crossed the third threshold. Because good metaphor. I don't know. <laughs> I, again, I can't really speak from my personal experience. I don't have like a lot of experiences talking to other people like this guy. So at least that, that, that gave me a reassurance. Yeah. So. So uh, we'll uh, pivot to the probably the last question, um, Laura. Frank, you uh, you totally cracked me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You cracked me up. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just yeah I'm gonna say like Dana's book and like Michael's guiding meditation are like one two punch like the best thing. It's like okay, if you can do two things, you read Michael's read Dana's book and listen to Dana's guided meditation, like together they're like. I don't know. They're just like a really good combination. Thanks. <laughs> but uh, check out the references in my stuff too. If you read my book and you're like, oh, I need some counterbalance, I reference all kinds of other people's stuff so that it'll round it out and provide lots of different voices and takes on it because it takes, you know, some people may need something really different from that. So definitely, you know, explore. Sorry cool. to interrupt you, Peter. Oh, um, I just had a question. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. It's been a really interesting conversation. Um, yes, as context, I, I practiced Zen residentially for a number of years and kind of saw it from the inside, the uh, impact that scandals with Buddhist teachers had on practitioners, um, the kind of loss of faith and the discouragement. And I had, I had a number of questions rise up for myself too. So I just wonder, yeah, what do you guys think the relationship between ethical conduct and awakening is? Um, is is a uh, is a lapse of ethical conduct a reflection of the level and like the uh, extensiveness of awakening? Um, yeah, how do you make sense of it? I'm just going to start with this one because I'm known for sort of talking about this a lot, and I've thought a lot about it. Um, I, I very much think of three trainings: morality, concentration, wisdom. Right. I take it as a working assumption for better or for worse, and I know some people don't like this about me, that just because you have, say, perceived the, you know, the impermanent nature of all phenomena, that you will necessarily be a nice person, right? Or just because you are super good at getting into deep, you know, peaceful states of consciousness, that you will, you know, be ethical, right? These are like, it's it, the analogy you use all the time is like, imagine we, the piano player a lot, 
imagine authors and piano players, okay? Authors and piano players both hit keys all day long, sometimes very fast in specific sequences, specifically designed to evoke feelings and sort of almost tell stories and create a sense of artistic, you know, something good in people. You would think that authors would be great piano players and piano players would be great authors. There is almost no evidence for this, though probably piano playing makes typing easier and typing might make piano play, playing easier. There's probably some muscle memory and, and something that has some little bit of correlation, but the rest of it, no, no way, right? And the same kind of way, just because I have, I have abundant evidence for people I know extremely well, some of them for many decades, that the simple fact that you might have be have you know a super impressive meditation resume or have profound dharma insights or really serious shanak chops or impressive you know realizations in some technical sense of path criteria or you know pick your favorite whatever does that automatically mean you might not you know have a personality disorder or you might not have have some ethical shadow sides with relationship to money power sex or you know the standard things or transference and counter transference no like unfortunately Unfortunately, and so like the and this is one of like the my biggest rants. Like seriously, the world needs to get over assuming that these seemingly unrelated skill sets automatically totally cross over. I consider that just unbelievably unfortunate propaganda that just does not work in, out in reality testing. Thank you for listening to my sort of explosion on that, <laughs> but it's something I I am, think is really important. And thank you for the opportunity to answer that. Would you, would you say that, sorry, um, if I may just, uh, would you say that compassion isn't a natural expression of wisdom? So compassion is a really funny thing. Um, I first think the personality disorder, sorry to take up the space on this one, but I first think the personality disorders are weirdly tough nuts to crack. I think that there are people who literally are born without empathy centers in any normal kind of way like we would think about them. And yes, maybe there are some survival advantages of that. And some of these can be really interesting, cool people. And I have some friends who I would consider some of these people, but does that mean that like when they wake up suddenly an empathy center that they never literally never had suddenly wakes up? I'm not sure that's that's actually true. And there are issues of cultural conditioning and shadow sides and psychology and, and all childhood stuff and all of that that enters into the mix. And so to just say compassion and to imagine that wisdom and compassion equate and that you know perceiving impermanence automatically makes you incredibly compassionate or per perceiving emptiness automatically makes you incredibly compassionate and that cap compassion automatically translates to whatever set of actions you're sure based on your point of view would be the compassionate thing to do. I, I, I just unfortunately think that level of naivete is dangerous and um, so and a really unfortunate and has led to a staggering amount of pain and loss of faith and harm. I think that as long, I think if you make gains in the wisdom axis, it's just more likely that you also make gains the other axis and vice versa, but that's just a degree of correlation, not causation, right? And also sometimes it's the other way. The more you realize emptiness, the more of an asshole you are. So it's kind of like the psychedelic thing where it goes those, well. those way, right? So, uh, and also what Daniel said about the teacher thing really resonated with me because I, I went to an art school and the best teachers are not the best artists. The best violinists were not the best teachers, right? They, they're sort of different. And then the, the, all the really great artists and really good violinists and virtuosos and musicians, they, they're kind of fucked up. <laughs> they're all like really great athletes. They're all kind of fucked up. And that, that fucked upness, just like when I said, use that fucked upness as a vessel for uh, realization, the, 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 the kind of talent that they have to run 100 meters under 10 seconds or create this beautiful painting, this thing that no one's ever thought of, I'll uh, come up with this like theories no one ever thought of. That drive could be the same drive to access certain states of consciousness during meditation, or think about think differently about the path, so he can you know go further without in, in sort of a different way, right? So so a lot of those uh, really accomplished masters, they're like spiritual athletes. That because they're like a little different, they're wired a little differently from everybody else. They can advance faster. But that difference, that that kind of like you know things that are not quote unquote not accepted in society, could be manifesting something very dark, or could be manifesting something super compassionate. This, who knows? But it's a matter of correlation, not causation. Yeah. So like Kenneth Falco says something like that. Um, if you look at your personal trainer, you and have him train you, work out, and get you know get fit, would you expect him to be a really good person? 
probably not. Same with meditation. You find a meditation teacher to help you wake up and for you to become a better meditator. But to always, you know, correlate the two between that being good at meditation, be good at awakening versus, you know, being a good person, complex person. It's a matter of correlation, not causation. And a lot of times they're just completely different. And uh, the problem is most people throughout traditions just have to lump those two together. And I think it's because emptiness training could be very dangerous in and of itself. That's why compassion is emphasized as part of the form that's like still up in emptiness, love and compassion. The reason why so many traditions like in Taiwan, all we emphasize in Taiwan, if you go to the temple, it's all about compassion. You don't hear about wisdom at all. If you talk to any the, the top Buddhists in Taiwan about like insights or like awakenings or successions or extreme mentions, they have no idea what you're talking about. But they're really good at you know being compassionate. The reason why so many the the the, the compassion access is so prevailing in today's world is because of you know the, the, the problem with just focusing on emptiness practice. And now sometimes in certain culture, they realize that holy shit. We need to fill this emptiness with a lot of compassion because of like the sort of the dark side or the detrimental side of, of just focusing only on emptiness. And that in itself only focuses on compassion and the form and love aspect of awakening. That could be in itself become sort of asymmetrical. As you see here, nobody here knows about what awakening is, but everyone knows how to say I'm a tofu and give you like, you know, give homeless people money. But you need the both, you need to find the balance. On the, I want to kind of tag on to that as well. And, um, you know, like Daniel specifies in, in his framing the three different trainings, right? And um, one thing that I, I, I seem to have noticed is that whatever awakening is, it doesn't make you transcend incentive structures. And it also doesn't <laughs> seem to make you transcend biology, as Daniel alluded to. And so when you bear that in mind, a lot of these sort of scandalous behaviors and so on make a lot more sense, right? So I would, I, I would personally recommend never treating any individual as if they have transcended incentive structures or as if they have transcended their biology because claims to have done so are usually false. Now, awakening can have some interesting effects in terms of modulating the way that your perceptual apparatus responds to incentive structures. And you know maybe that's what Frank's getting at when he mentions that improving on the wisdom access can perhaps correlate or help you with improving on the compassion access if you have the right biology for it and if your incentive structures social and internal are aligned towards that but i do think it's a pretty big mistake to say there's a blanket even correlation between awakening and compassion in this sense and that when we when we look at the incentive structures of historically existing um uh, groups of people who talk about awakening, they might have had some incentives to talk about compassion and how being awakened makes you compassionate and they get to define what compassion is that are probably worth sort of tracing and following back and speculating about a bit in terms of why it's so tied into the historical teachings that we have records of. I, I agree with that completely. Like awakening just gives you a more vast, spacious, you know, awareness, your mind becomes huge. But then like that, that, that memo is still there. But the memo was just the, the, the suffering or the, the cravings or whatever thing that was going on in the, in the Mitsu is just smaller relatively to the infinite space of awareness, but it's still there. And sometimes after you enter non Diwali or access uh, this type of awareness, the, the, the stuff of the Mitsu gets bypassed because you don't, even if you don't realize it anymore because your awareness is so huge, but then it's still there, processes its own like traumas and stuff like that, its own you know, shadowy side. And when it gets bypassed, when, you, when the opportunities or the condition rise for you to like arise again, it becomes even more explosive. And that's why you see a lot of those problems in the, in the circle. It's not like they intentionally try to like, you know, rape little boys. It's maybe like they did access like, like God consciousness, but because of this like non dual awareness, they, they, they bypass their problems, not intentionally, maybe some of them intentionally, but you know, it, it sort of get bypassed through emptiness, but it's, somehow it's still there in their body. Just leveraging off of what Frank is saying, you know, this is why uh, we must have uh, peers and even teachers as much as possible. Somebody who uh, is willing to call you on your shit because you can't see what you can't see. And, you know, if you can't see it, no, you know, Matt, let's say you're really, you know, you really are trying to be as ethical as possible and all that, but there's just some stuff you're unaware of. And, and uh, that's just the nature of the beast. Meditation, uh, Wilbur's really good at talking about, there's stuff that meditation just cannot see. Mm -hmm. 
And you must have other people uh, show you that in order to ever see it. And I've had then you can literally, oh, sorry, go ahead. I've said people literally say stuff to me like, you know, I can totally dissolve my body into particles, but my marriage is still sucks. And I'm like, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I mean, right. As a teacher, I hear that stuff literally daily. And it's like, you know, maybe some relationship therapy is, you know, having a third person in there to talk. You need other people to reflect uh, what's going on with you. And I do think that, you know, we are a communal species. We're not meant to just be alone, number one. And two, we know that people, whether it's dictators or, you know, any structure where people get outside of uh, uh, the milieu where other people can criticize them, they tend to just go off the deep end. Uh, we are we require feedback from other people that's critical and um, uh, nuanced. And, and just being awakened to whatever level doesn't remove that in any way. You still need that feedback. So with teachers, I think people do get tremendous compassion really often just as a side effect of the opening. But then there's all the stuff they can't see that they're doing. And they, you know, this is why the good traditions continue to provide a lot of uh, uh, structure of feedback. It's something that I think in the West, we actually are uniquely, you know, suited to do even better. You know, we should have our spiritual teaching and this kind of uh, uh, group feedback uh, combined really heavily, even for, or maybe especially for teachers who have a lot of students. I have a question for, for Daniel and, and Michael that, uh, about this conversation. Do you guys think it's easier to sort of, quote unquote, clean up your shit after awakening when you body non dual awareness because you can, I guess, perceive more and you're more aware? Or maybe it's harder because when you're at the state, you just kind of don't give a fuck. Or I know it's not absolute, but from, because yeah, I know you work with a lot of clients. Does it make it easier to deal with your shit after awakening? Or does it make it harder because you just don't give a shit anymore because no, it's quote unquote nobody here? I think it makes it easier if you've decided to work on it because the solidity and fixation is really you know lubricated and removed. But as you're saying, Frank, you might not care. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, you got to care first. Well, 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 yeah, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. In a way, it's basically the same question as asking, is it easier to make the world a better place when you're rich? Well, yeah, sure. But a lot of people don't seem to have much in the motive, mo way of motivation to do that, right? You, you have additional leverage and power, but... That's a really good analogy. I like that. Cool. So um, we passed uh, the bottom of the hour, so we're going to close out soon. But uh, for these sessions, I usually like to give uh, our guests just uh, our, like around the table, any closing thoughts, anything that came alive, anything you're taking away with today. We should have a two-hour session next time. <laughs> I'm down. Just always a down. People, a lot of people didn't get to ask their questions. Yeah, as I've said before, keep your wits about you and keep a sense of humor. I just feel tremendously happy to be here and to see all your faces and I uh, hope to talk to you again soon sometime. Sam. Uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, having everyone here, uh, every, everyone I can see and everyone with their cameras off and uh, deep gratitude to Daniel, Frank, Michael for showing up and hang out on the panel with me and to Peter for putting everything together. Evan, amazing job on the questions and answers. I mean, uh, real appreciation for what you bring to this. I, you. I think I, I think online gurus are kind of like non-physical gurus, like when you appear in the dream. Because like when we talk about the beginning of the internet, it's like this new thing that connects like, the ancient with the, with the postmodern. And like Daniel and Michael are like my non-physical guru, because like with the internet, it's kind of like in a dream, you know? It's more dreamlike. <laughs> And then when I see you guys in like quote-unquote real life, it's still dreamlike. It's still no physical. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you get transmissions like easier for, probably from just the internet than like, you know, physically maybe so, in some way or sense. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, 
Yeah, uh, to close out, uh, before I make some closing announcements on upcoming events, uh, just Daniel, Frank, Michael, uh, Evan, thank you so much for coming to the store today and having this conversation. And yeah, to echo Michael's thoughts, Evan, uh, excellent job. Uh, Evan's our resident uh, genius and resident here at the, the STOA. He's a, he's a hidden thank secret you, that we have. Uh, so thank you, Evan, so much. Um, we got tons of events at the STOA. For those of you who don't know, we have a wisdom gym, a bunch of reoccurring events, a bunch of one-offs. Uh, our next kind of session in this series, Stealing the Culture with Dialogos on Meta Modern Play. We got Daniel Gertz, he's like the main guy for Meta Modernism. John Verveke, Sarah Perry, she's like a central in the post rational scene, and Lawrence Curry Clark. So that's a really interesting combination. Uh, at the store, we're having conversations that people have never seen before um, to help us steal the culture. That being said, uh, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the store today. Was it some Frank Yang on, on the on the way out? What was the music? <laughs> <laughs>